So welcome to the Data Intensive Computing and I.O. track at uh, ATPESC. Uh, my name is Phil Carnes. I'm uh, from Argonne National Laboratory. Um, I'm one of four lecturers we'll have today, but I'm just getting us started with the introductory material. Um, congratulations on making it to Friday in your first week of, of ATPESC. So as uh, you guys have probably seen already, we're going to um, sort of shift focus each day and touch on different kind of key topics in high performance computing. So today is all about I.O. and storage. Um, and at a high level, we're going to try and uh, uh, teach you guys a little bit about how HPC storage systems work so you understand what you're dealing with and, and what's good and what's bad about them. Uh, we're going to teach you about some tools that you can use to simplify how you manage your data. Um, kind of common things that are, uh, in a lot of cases, things that are available at most any system that you would use is uh, so that you can take this home or take this to whatever facility you're working at. And we're going to do a lot of um, kind of how to tune your code, how to be more efficient in accessing your data so you get more, more bang for your buck. So the uh, agenda for the day, um, this is just a high level. This isn't every, every presentation, but... Uh, I'm going to be talking about introductory concepts mostly this morning so that you have a baseline for why we're going to do the things we do later and uh, tell you about some common kind of utilities and tools and things you can use to work with your data. As the day goes on, we're going to get a little more specific and talk about actually APIs that you can use in your application and libraries that you can use. And finally, how to actually uh, tune your application, how to find problems and correct them and kind of you know common problems, that sort of thing. Um, so I want to go ahead and tell you early on, we have uh, a reservation on the Theta machine at ALCF for the whole day. Um, actually, I guess starting in about half an hour, it opens up at 9, and it runs till 9 o'clock tonight. Um, it's not a lot of nodes, but it's enough that you have dedicated access and can run some examples and sort of try things out if you want to during breaks and as you have time. Uh, all of my slides at the top have a, a link to hands-on materials. Um, you can check that out now and go to that website and see what kind of exercises are there. And we'll refer to those through the day and tell you about specific ones that we'd, we think you'd uh, like to try out. So uh, who do we have here today? Um, so our uh, uh, Rob Latham in the upper left-hand corner, uh, he's back there waving. Um, he's uh, my colleague at Argonne and has worked on quite a bit of different uh, data intensive IO infrastructure all the way from how uh, applications interface with the storage system to IO transformations to actual file systems. Um, so he has a lot of expertise. We also have Glenn Lockwood right there next to Rob. Uh, Glenn's visiting from uh, NERSC. He uh, specializes in IO architectures and designing next generation systems. So he knows a lot about um, technologies that are coming and how we're building systems to adapt to it. And he's done a lot of work that kind of relates to that, like how to measure storage systems, how to benchmark them and find out their performance, um, and how to kind of inspect what they're doing. Uh, Quincy's going to be joining us a little bit later, so I can't, can't make him stand up and wave. But um, Quincy Koziel is also from NERSC, and he is an expert in the HDF5 uh, high-level library, if some of you are, are familiar with that. And um, he'll be talking about that. And if you have any questions, he's the guy. Like, you're not going to find anybody else on earth that knows more about, about that stuff. Um, and then myself, I'm Phil Carnes again. I'm, I'm at Argonne. I work with Rob and have done a lot of projects in different parts of the storage system. A lot, a lot to do with understanding storage systems and simulating them and improving them. So together, what uh, the kind of things that your lecturers do during the day um, our ultimate goal is to take all this kind of computer science, uh, you know, hardware technology and make it available for uh, use in science domains. So, you know, we can't just uh, buy a few thousand hard drives, throw them on the floor and say, have fun. Um, there's a lot, lot that goes, you know, in between that and making, uh, making the math and science happen. And so the things that we're kind of experts in are, uh, you know, running actual data centers, keeping things up and operational, um, kind of characterizing storage use so we understand what applications and users are doing and can, you know, handle that better. Uh, we model storage systems so that we can predict what things will be like if we make different changes. Um, a lot of optimization and improving software 
and just generally trying to make this the capabilities of the hardware available to, to you guys. So the, the first sort of topic we're going to talk about this morning is just principles of high performance computing I.O. Um, so for the next 20 minutes or so, we're not going to talk about any specific piece of software. This is more like how the systems work and why we're going to do the things that we do so you have some background. So HPC I.O. is all about storing and retrieving scientific data on a high performance computing platform. It's, it's that simple. Um, what this always revolves around is a parallel file system. Um, a parallel file system is like any other file system, but it's optimized for uh, quickly storing and accessing enormous volumes of data, so gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, that sort of thing. And to make these things work well, we have to coordinate a lot of different hardware components, uh, some system software and applications, of course. And if we do a bad job of this, um, you're not going to make good use of your core hours, the time that you have on a machine. So if you have a thousand nodes um, to compute with and they spend 30 seconds waiting on data, that's you know, 30 times a thousand seconds that you've just lost um, from your productivity. So we want to try and minimize that. So a lot of the things we're talking about are how to take care of parallel file systems and, and make them happy and get the most out of them. So like I was saying, a parallel file system looks like any other file system like you have on, on all your laptops with uh, files and directories, but they don't act like normal file systems. And so uh, a lot of what I want to get across this morning is how they're not like normal file systems so you know what things you do on your workstation or laptop or uh, any other system, how you might want to adjust that to make best use of a high performance computing platform. And we'll, uh, as the day goes on, we'll get a little more specific about how to achieve kind of getting in the right zone. So the, the first thing I want to talk about that's unique about uh, high performance computing I.O. is that when you log on to a system, you have a lot of different storage systems to choose from. So if you'll uh, be patient with me for a minute, I've, I've gotten uh, a metaphor here. If you uh, saw a lot of different vehicles sitting outside and you wanted to pick one that was good at a particular task, like you wanted to carry a lot of material, you wanted your buddies to be able to ride with you, you wanted to just be really fast, um, you wanted to go somewhere quick that's nearby, if you look at a bunch of vehicles, it's obvious what they're good at and you know which one you're going to pick, right? I mean, they, they just look like they're going to do what they do. And so how does that map to what you see on a HPC system when you look at the file systems available? Um, these things in red are, are actually storage systems that are available at NERSC and the ALCF on the systems. And they have all different names, project, projects, local, global. And if you just saw these names, it's not necessarily obvious how you would make the same mapping. What's the fastest one? You know, what's the safest one? Uh, what's the one that's easiest to share with your friends? What's, what's best for something quick? Um, so the, the takeaway from this is read your site's documentation, all of them, every, uh, every big computing center will have a table somewhere in their documentation that says here are our file systems, here's the names of them, here's what they're good at, here's how big they are, here's how fast they are. And you have to be careful when you go from site to site because uh, naming isn't consistent across sites. Um, I highlighted two here. Uh, NERSC and, and ALCF have a project and a project, so they are not the same thing. They don't serve the same role. And one of them has a scratch and the other one has an environment variable scratch. Those point to different types of file systems entirely. So just make sure when you go to a new facility especially, don't make assumptions about what file systems are there and what they're good at. You've got to look at your documentation. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, this is more of a cautionary tale. If we go back to the, the car metaphor, um, when you look at the controls, you know, the dashboard for a vehicle, it's pretty clear what it can do. Um, you know, does it have a, the kind of steering wheel you might see in a race car? Does it have levers for you know, dumping lots of data and stuff? You can kind of get a feel for how to interact with the vehicle in the right way based on what controls you have. So how, how does that map to file systems? Um, you know, here's all, here's the many different interfaces they have. They all have the same, same uh, open files, closed files, read and write. Um, so this is, in a lot of ways, this is a good thing because it means if you write an application for one type of file system, you go somewhere else, it's still going to work. They have the same interface. Um, but it can also be a little deceptive because it means that you can get away with running things on the wrong kind of storage system, and it'll work. 
um, you just might not make good use of your time. So again, just uh, you know, keep an eye on your facility documentation and make sure you're using the right tool for the job, even though there, there may be several that will technically work. Uh, the second thing, um, and we'll get into more detail about you know, the specifics of what's in a storage system, but the, uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that these are just tremendously large and complicated storage systems. Um, and they're large and complicated because of how many storage devices are in them, how much data they have to store. It's not unusual for a big facility like a Department of Energy lab to have 10,000 hard drives hooked up to a system. And you, know, you have to have a lot of infrastructure to keep 10,000 hard drives working at once and be able to access any of them. So you have diagrams that look like, uh, this is one from the Cori system at NURSE, they're one of their file systems. And so there's all these components. And because there's all these components and all these uh, pieces in between you and the data, that means it's gonna react differently than a laptop where your hard drive is right there next to your application. So for example, if you want to access data from a process in your application, it's going to go through the compute node on the network to a forwarding node through an InfiniBand uh, network fabric to a file server, from the file server to a disk array, from the disk array to a disk. Then you're gonna get your data. Then it's gonna go back up the same path. Um, so what this means is that the latency, how long it takes to get one little piece of information from you know, a disk drive to your application is actually really, really bad. Um, much slower than your laptop, in fact. Even though you imagine this is a multi-million dollar storage system is so fast, um, there's some things that it cannot do as quickly as your laptop can. And so that's, that's a bad thing, um, but there's a, a silver lining to this, and you maybe can guess by looking at the diagram, is that it can do one of those things uh, hundreds, thousands of times at once um, if you have a parallel application. So even though the individual latency to get one byte off of the storage system is bad, you can do a whole bunch of those at one time and so the aggregate throughput, moving uh, big chunks of data simultaneously is really, really good. So a lot of what you'll hear today is about getting parallel file systems into what they're good at. So if you're moving big chunks of data in parallel, it's gonna be great. You're gonna get tremendous numbers, good performance. If you spend your time waiting on small things to happen, it's not great. So we're gonna be working to get you in the right kind of performance area. Now the third thing, and you guys are probably aware of this, is that in scientific computing, you usually have some sophisticated data models. There may be multi-dimensional arrays, different types, nested types. Um, you have images, videos. There may be text that you're processing. And there's attributes and headers that describe the data. So this is all nice stuff in terms of organizing scientific data. Uh, the storage systems and other covers don't understand any of that. Um, you know, on a file system, you have a hierarchy of containers, directories. You have files that just have a stream of bytes in it, and that's it. So a lot of the things that we do are about mapping these kind of more sophisticated scientific data models into something that the storage system can deal with effectively. And we've got a lot of libraries to help with that. This isn't, this isn't um, the application developer or the scientist's job to figure this out. We're gonna try and equip you with some tools that can do this, do this well. We'll talk about a few of those today. Uh, the fourth thing I wanted to mention is um, not only are there a lot of different file systems available at each site, probably, um, but each site is different. Um, high performance computing systems are very specialized and their storage systems are no different. At any given time, there's maybe half a dozen vendors that can build a file system that will keep up with uh, a large scale scientific uh, computing platform. And so what works best for one storage system is not necessarily gonna be what works best for another. They have subtle differences, they have a little different hardware, they have a little different features. And so the, the thing to do when possible is to find some portable libraries and tools that you can trust to work across different platforms because the people that build those have done a lot of work to make sure that when you do something on a Lustre file system, it works pretty well. And when you do something on an IBM Spectrum scale, it works pretty well too, without you changing your application. Um, if you find that you're having to make a lot of detailed optimizations for a particular system, then you, know, you should slow down and think about it and make sure you really need to do that or if there's something that can hide some of that for you. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what your options are there. 
And then uh, learning some basic performance debugging tools. So you go to a, a new site, a new file system, it runs a little different. Um, kind of knowing where to start so that you know how to get a, a feel for, for what's going on. And I'll, I'll give an example of, of how, how this looks. So one thing you'll see through the day is a lot of times we think about the software for a storage system as a stack. Um, at the very bottom you have uh, I.O. hardware, so this is where your hard drives and servers and things are. At the very top you have your application. And to map things between the two, um, there's usually uh, something that supports your data model. It would be a high level library usually. Um, you have transformations that kind of manipulate that data to get it to the file system. That's usually MPIO or maybe some forwarding software. And at the bottom you have a parallel file system. The parallel file system is the thing that takes all the hard drives and all the hardware and makes it look like one united thing. So if you were to look at what, are, what these things actually are on Mira, that's the, the biggest platform at the ALCF, um, at the top in red, you have things like HDF5, Parallel Net CDF, Audios, Silo, there's other things you could be using. And then as you go down the stack, you're gonna start getting into things that are specific to that system. So the transforms are things that are fairly common like MPIO, but then on, on Mira, which is an IBM machine, there's software called the IBM CIOD that uh, moves data from compute nodes to the storage system. Um, it's got its own type of file system, this IBM Spectrum Scale or GPFS, you might hear it referred to also. And so things get kind of specific to your platform as you go down the stack. So what happens if you go to a different system? So we can look at another system that's also at Argon Theta. Um, you might think they're similar because they're at the same place, but they're not necessarily that similar. Um, so as you go down the stack, things are different. The IBM CIOD is gone, and instead you have something called an LNAT router. We might talk about that a little bit later. Um, you have an entirely different file system called Luster, and the hardware is different. You're writing to a different file system. And so if you were uh, concerned about all of those details, you might be changing strategies for I.O. across uh, these platforms. But really, the top part hasn't changed. It's still HDF5, Parallel Net CDF, Audios, whatever, whatever other libraries you want to use. So if you can use those things, they're working to try and make it work right regardless of what stack is up under it. So we're gonna try and encourage you to pick common tools like that when, when possible. And then what does this look like in the future? Um, so new machines are coming all the time. And uh, if you're into uh, high performance data storage, there's all sorts of neat technologies that um, are always over the horizon. So you may have object storage systems, you might have non-volatile memory there might be uh, key value storage systems, there might be all, all sorts of new file systems. But again, no matter what it is, there's going to be some common libraries on top. If you keep using those, you'll be still be doing the right thing when the new technology rolls out. That's what, what we hope. And then the, the fifth thing, the last thing, it's not, I don't wanna go too long with the list here, is uh, performance variability. So no matter what, platform you're on, what facility you're at, um, whether it's a university site or a government site or a commercial site, I.O. performance is not going to be stable. It just isn't. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, at the most basic form, if you have 10,000 hard drives, they're never going to perform the same way at the same time. Some of them are going to be faster, some of them are going to be slower, some of them that will change over time, some will become slower, some will become faster. Um, more importantly is the hard drives you're using are not yours alone. You know, if you allocate compute nodes, you get unrestricted access to those compute nodes. Those are yours while you're running your application and you know that nothing's going to interfere with it. Um, the storage system is not like that. There's one global, usually one or a few global storage systems for everyone and everyone's using it at the same time. So. If you're the, the little fish on this uh, list of jobs here, you're the 512 node job and someone's running a 16,000 node job, they have a lot more links to the storage system and they can slow it down for you. Um, so, and not only that, it's not just jobs on your system, but there's probably other systems connected to it. So the project file system of the ALCF has uh, at least three, three compute resources hooked up to it. There's also wide area transfers to other facilities going on. There's archive access, so a lot of things can be touching your storage. Um, so the upshot is expect performance to vary. It's not, it's not strange if it does, that's just the way it is. Um, 
and what this means for, for you as you're trying to improve your application is that you need to take multiple measurements if you're really getting serious about understanding your I.O. performance. So I gave an example here from an old system called uh, Edison. It's, it's retired now. But on Edison, we uh, ran 15 identical I.O. benchmarks um, on the same day. You know, nothing, nothing unusual about that. Uh, that was using 6,000 processes and just measured how long does it take to do the I.O. And we plotted it. So occasionally it was as fast as 50 seconds and got all the I.O. done, and sometimes it was as slow as 63 seconds. We weren't changing the application. We're just running it over and over again. And so you have to think about this. If you um, learn something today and you're like, I'm going to make this little tweak. It's going to make it faster, I'm pretty sure. And you're like, well, let me check. Let me, let me run a benchmark and see. If you made a change that would gain you five seconds of I.O. time, that's great. That's, that's an important thing to do. But if you just happen to run it again and the system was slower, you might not see that improvement. You may say, oh, those, those at pest guys, they taught me something that didn't pan out. But uh, just, <laughs> just be aware that the performance is going to fluctuate some, um, and it's beyond your control. There's, you can't really, can't really help that um, for the most part. Uh, later today, Glenn will talk about some capabilities that some systems have to help mitigate this. But by and large, you should, you should expect this. So uh, just to recap the things that I kind of wanted to get across for you guys to understand about um, high performance I.O. at a high level. So above all, look at your documentation for your facility, not just general documentation for your software, but documentation put together by your facility about what their system is like. Um, when you can, move big data in parallel. Involve as many processes as you can. Involve as much storage as you can. Get things going concurrently. Um, try not to wait, um, or importantly, try not to have all your processes wait while you're moving one little piece of data. That's, uh, that's a little <coughs> tough. Um, use libraries that are appropriate for your data model that can hide some of this complexity and protect you with some performance portability as you go between platforms. Um, go learn some performance debugging basics. Um, we, don't, we don't expect everyone to come away from here as an I.O. expert, but we want you to know where to start so that you can kind of get a feel for what's going on. And just be aware that performance fluctuates. Um, don't be alarmed if it does. It, it just happens. Um, you can mitigate it a little bit, but it's going to be there. And I guess one thing to kind of idea to follow up on um, is that when you come away from here or you go home and you do some I.O. tuning, um, you can get some big improvements with some fairly simple changes a lot of times. But uh, unfortunately, you're, not, you're never really totally done. Um, things change, right? Someone else works on your code. They add a feature. Um, maybe your science objectives change and you start looking at different data or using your data differently. You just get hours on a new machine. And so something changes and your I.O. performance isn't necessarily good anymore um, or it's different somehow. So we like to think of this as an ongoing cycle. Um, so the, the diagram kind of hiding back here is from control theory. But you can think of it as observing the system, having tools to do that. We'll talk about um, one in a minute here called Darshan that lets you just look at what's going on and understand it. Uh, you'll need to orient that in kind of uh, in context with things that you've learned. So we're, we're giving you some background knowledge today. So when you see something, you'll be like, ah, yeah, I remember. This is a, this is a particular thing we need to look out for. Um, decide what to do. Uh, ask your support uh, contacts about that. Say, I'm, I'm seeing this. I think I need to do this. Is that a good idea that can help steer you? And then uh, implement the optimizations. Um, you know, use the tools we'll, we'll teach you about today in libraries and optimization techniques to you know, fix the problem and start it again. You know, check, check back on it later and see, see how you're doing. And that's it for the uh, introductory presentation. Um, do you guys have any questions about kind of the general, general concepts we're talking about today? I think that this will be covered later uh, in, in detail, but um, I, the thing that I was wondering is basically like coming from a place of tons of ignorance about like I.O. hardware stuff, like are the challenges it, or directions in I.O. hardware the same as for like the typical computing stuff about like heterogeneity or anything like that or is it like more like old model or? Uh, 
Yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a tough question. So in, in some sense, yes. Uh, Glenn is going to talk about that a little more this afternoon about some of the different things you might have. Um, I, w I would say that uh, at a high level, storage systems have appeared largely the same for decades. You know, there, there may be more um, heterogeneous hardware within it, but often the way you use it isn't so different <laughs> except for subtle changes. So um, that's, that's kind of the track we're on right now, I would say. But we'll have more about that this afternoon.